So we'll be talking to Martin about his ideas, about his background, and of course about his new book. So if I can just introduce Martin for a moment. Martin has co-authored more than 500 academic papers on subjects such as the Big Bang and Dark Matter. And he's also a long-standing member of the House of Lords and has previously been the president of the Royal Society. This is a position that Isaac Newton once held. More recently, in the book that we're here to talk about today, On the Future, Prospects for Humanity, Martin has explored the biggest issues facing the human race today. <laughs> <laughs> in his book he talks about the rise of artificial intelligence and other issues like climate change and discusses how we should best combat these challenges and we will be talking a little bit more about these issues in the second part of the interview so i'd like to start martin by just talking to you a little bit about yourself and your career so did you always know that you wanted to be an astronomer um no, L let me just say, I have no idea what questions you're going to ask me, so <laughs> entirely unrehearsed. Um, He's well, also uh, told me that if he doesn't like a question, he'll just yes, say yes. it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Right. Um, uh, uh, no, I didn't have any firm childhood ambition. I mean, I was interested in nature and numbers and things. Um, but then um, I proved to be good at maths, and so I was uh, persuaded to do maths as a student when I went to university. And I decided I didn't like it very much. I wasn't going to be a mathematician. So I thought of what to do using my mathematical skills. And I thought quite seriously about being an economist. Um, but uh, um, I, I then, uh, through a chain of accidents, had the chance to um, work for my PhD in a group at Cambridge, um, which um, uh, was working on cosmology and things. And I was very lucky, because this was a time uh, when um, there were new discoveries being made, um, evidence for the Big Bang, black holes and things like that. And um, I'd give any young person the advice that if you go into a field of science, pick one where new things are happening. Because then the experience of the old guys is at a discount and you can make an impact <laughs> fairly quickly. And I was quite lucky in that sense in that uh, I was able, uh, while still a student and uh, a young researcher, to make some quite significant discoveries. Can you tell us a bit about what they thought? Um, well, this was the early days when <coughs> we were uh, finding evidence that uh, our universe um, uh, had evolved from some hot, dense beginning. And we were trying to uh, understand how it changed from that state to its present state. And we were trying to understand um, uh, uh, objects called black holes, uh, which are very extreme consequence of Einstein's theory. Uh, which uh, happen uh, when a star collapses and they exist in a sense of galaxies. And uh, this has been one of my ongoing interests. Uh, so it was really to try to make sense. And I didn't um, do any very mathematical work. Um, I was uh, in the same group as Stephen Hawking, and he was two years senior to me. Uh, and he diverged towards doing more math mathematical work. And I was more in touch with observations. Um, but uh, my work has been very interactive with observations, just trying to make sense of all the wonderful mysteries which have been found in, uh, in space. And of course, the main advances have come not because of armchair theorists like me, um, but uh, uh, through better and better equipment, telescopes on the ground and in space, and computers to do simulations. But we can't do experiments on stars and galaxies. We can just do, uh, um, uh, do simulations in, in the lab. And uh, the people who really deserve the credit are the um, uh, people who build these instruments and work on. And uh, I was giving a talk earlier this week to some engineers um, at, a at a conference at the, at the South Bank Centre. And I reminded them of a very nice cartoon that all engineers like, uh, which uh, shows two beavers looking up at a big hydroelectric dam. And one beaver says to the other, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, as preemptive modesty, uh, this uh, uh, indicates the balance between what we armchair theorists do um, and uh, what the instrument builders and the computer scientists do. <laughs> so what's going to be the uh, equivalent of the hydroelectric dam, do you think? <laughs> uh, well, of course, we already have it. We have uh, uh, huge telescopes and uh, um, uh, European scientists are building a, a telescope in Chile. Uh, which is um, 
uh, called the Extremely Large Telescope. They're rather unimaginative <laughs> in their, <laughs> the ELT. They're rather unimaginative in their nomenclature. Uh, but it will, it will have a mirror um, 39 meters across. And that's, I guess, probably a bit bigger than the width of this, this tent. Um, and um, that's going to be uh, wonderful new instruments. We have similar things in space, which are smaller. And that's going to do a number of things. It's going to be able to probe further away and therefore further back in the past, so we understand the early history of galaxies. But also, the other exciting development in our subject has been the realization that the stars we see in the sky are not just twinkling points of light, uh, they are suns mainly orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is orbited by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And these so-called exoplanets are um, uh, very hard to detect. They're so faint that we only know about them indirectly. Uh, but these huge telescopes will be able to actually image a possible other Earth around another star. And then, of course, the next question is, is there going to be life on any of those? And, uh, is there going to be life on any of those? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, what a well, good question. <laughs> well, I think the, the answer is we don't know. And um, uh, biology is a much more complicated subject uh, than uh, uh, the, the, the physics or astronomy, I like to say that the smallest insect is harder to understand than, than a star or a galaxy. So we don't know yet, but we will, within 10 or 20 years, know if there's some sort of biosphere on some of these planets, um, some evidence for life. Um, intelligent life, of course, um, is uh, um, uh, something which we can't speculate about even uh, as definitely as simple life. Um, but. Um, it's the question I'm most often asked as an astronomer. Uh, is there any alien intelligence out there? Um, and uh, I think it's the most fascinating question. Um, I don't hold my breath for success, but uh, I am involved in some projects to actually look for evidence of something artificial out there or some artificial <coughs> signal. Of course, there are some people who know the answer already. I get letters from people <laughs> who, uh, uh, who say, um, uh, they've, um, uh, 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 they've met the aliens, they've been abducted by the aliens, etc. And I um, uh, say two things to these people. I say, first, do you really think that if the aliens had made a huge effort to uh, traverse interstellar space to come here, would they just make a corn circle, meet one or two well-known cranks, and go away again? <laughs> Seems unlikely. And I tell these people to write to each other and not to me. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so that, that brings us, I think, quite nicely onto one of the, the main <laughs> premises in, in your book, which yes. is a, a phrase that you repeat very often in the book, um, which, which is that uh, technology is morally neutral and that no yes. matter how many sort of bad decisions we've made or bad things that have happened in the world as a result of our misuse and abuse of scientific advancement and technology, you mentioned, for example, the atomic bomb, that yes. we should still keep going with, with moving forward with artificial intelligence, technology, traveling to other planets, solar systems. Um, now, I'm sure we could all agree that sort of philosophically that this is probably true, but do you think on some level that this can be abused, that it could be irresponsible to sort of keep going with this research? Well, I mean, I think we've got to distinguish sort of uh, uh, basic science, understanding nature, understanding atoms, um, understanding the environment, understanding Darwinian evolution and things like that, uh, which indeed is, is, is ethically neutral. Uh, but of course, the way science is applied uh, is anything but ethically neutral. And uh, uh, the way it's applied is um, uh, um, a decision that should be made just, not just by scientists, but of course by the wider public. Um, and of course, uh, we, we see um, many examples uh, of, of this where, um, uh, you mentioned it, Hoi Bohm is the most obvious case. Um, was that the right thing to do, etc. Um, and uh, we see this now um, in biology. Um, we have the possibility to modify uh, people's genome. Um, should we do this to uh, remove a handicap? Should we do this for human enhancement? All those are the questions. Are you talking about the CRISPR-Cas9 system yeah, yeah, for yeah, genetic yes, modification? Yes, yes I think most, most people are happy about uh, um, you know, eliminating Huntington's disease or something like that, mm -hmm. which you can do by ch changing one gene. But uh, uh, if sort of human enhancement became possible, as it might one day, that's an ethical issue. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the uses of, uh, uh, of, of cyber and AI, 
um, are, uh, of course, they're ambivalent. They can be can be good and bad. Um, and of course, uh, uh, medical knowledge um, uh, has been certainly benign in uh, narrowing the gap in life expectancy between um, countries, uh, countries in Africa and the rest of the world. But uh, there are some possibilities where we might be ambivalent. So I think um, uh, we've got to realize that science can be applied in a variety of ways, and we have to choose which uh, way it should go. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a panel at midday um, on, um, on space travel, and I think this is an interesting case when uh, um, the high point of manned space flight was 50 years ago, Neil Armstrong's one small step on the moon, um, and uh, that was done for political reasons, and quite rightly, um, there's been no effort to repeat that because it's, a, it's something for which there's no, no purpose. Um, and to give two other examples, um, 50 years ago was the first flight of the Concorde. And we know what happened to that because that was a, a technology which was possible, but there was no, no demand for it, etc. Uh, it was also the first commercial flight of the jumbo jet. And uh, the jumbo jet um, has continued, uh, not, made, not changed very much. Um, we fly in the same way as we did 50 years ago. So uh, some technologies uh, fizzle out because there's no demand. Some evolve rather slowly, whereas some, uh, like uh, AI and the technology in our smartphones, evolve very, very fast. And uh, they raise challenges that we've got to cope with. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.